and welcome to TFR 2022. So tonight's class is extra special because we will try with the help of Father to gain a deeper understanding of the Lord's Prayer, which is the Our Father. So this is a prayer that Jesus himself taught us or taught his disciples. And Jesus himself gave us this prayer to serve as our model for all our prayers. It is said that the Lord's Prayer is the summation of the entire gospel. All of us, I am sure, often pray the Our Father, but do we understand the various aspects of this prayer and how can we internalize this prayer so that it becomes a pious pattern of our petition to God and a way of entrusting our entire life to Him? Uh, this class is the first of two parts, and today Father JP will walk us through the first three petitions of the Lord's Prayer. So Father, over to you. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Let us pray to Our Lady, and the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Saint Gabriel, pray for us. Saint Paul, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Uh, we go now to the field of spiritual theology. Uh, in the past lessons, I have been discussing to you morals. Our Lord is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Fulfillment of all the commandments. We want to follow Him. We want to, um, to, to imitate Him. But in imitating Him, first and foremost, is to pray with Him. To pray like Him. And the prayer that He taught us is what we call the Our Father. It's also termed as the Lord's Prayer. But actually, people debate on that because the Lord's Prayer um, is not really the prayer of Jesus because forgive us our trespasses. So others would call it uh, the disciples' prayer. Our Lord could not say forgive our trespasses because he did not sin against the Father. Yeah? Others would say it's the model prayer, etc., etc. Um, the Latin is pater noster. And we will study the seven petitions in two lessons. Today, I will discuss the first three. There are deep realities already in the first phrase alone, in the Our Father. And I will discuss to you, first and foremost, that. I want to tell you uh, things about God as our Father. This divine filiation that we have in Him. Then I proceed to expounding further on the connection between filiation, if all of us are children of God, our Father, then definitely there are implications on how we would deal with each other. We are brothers to one another, fraternity. The third, um, this is the basis of the spiritual life as St. Maria proposed. This is the foundation of everything, the divine filiation. And such awareness, I say all of us are children of God, but such awareness, in fact, can be detrimental to how you deal also with one another, with the society, and also with uh, your own um, behavior to the others. And then last but not the least, we proceed with the petitions. The petitions, our Father who art in heaven, after the address to God, there are three petitions that we will talk about today in reference to him. The outline I used is uh, a poem. If you will complete the outline later on, you will notice that they rhyme. They're all in seven syllables. Okay. First, God is our Father. Our Father who art in heaven. Uh, and um, there is a wonderful thing that uh, our Lord is revealing the, there to us. Uh, he situated this revelation in the context of a sermon on the mount in St. Matthew. Now, he prepared a lot for that. This is located in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And he uses the word Father 17 times. Now, it's a novelty for the Jews. Because in the Hebrew Bible, Father is uh, referred to God only 11 times. So in, in that sermon alone, it was a great novelty. Now, Jesus Christ is telling us to call God our Father. This is a revelation. This is something that we could not capture, understand, without our Lord Jesus Christ. 
In fact, if you will investigate, you will ask the Muslims, uh, those who follow Islam, for them, this is very difficult to understand. Because fatherhood for them is related to the biological fatherhood. And fatherhood for them is like a blasphemous remark. We are passing to God something that is human. So in the revelation of this uh, to our Lord, he is like giving us how to turn to our, our Lord, turn to our Father, to our God. Address him as Father. And that begins all the other petitions. That is the starting point. In other words, all the petitions that will come after is because we're asking him as a son. Okay? Um, when he discusses this, um, he's a father. It is because it is something essential to God. You know, there's a Christian writer who even said that um, uh, if he had teachings summarized, is all his teachings summarized, it is in this, that he wanted us to recognize God as our father because he really is a father before everything else. Okay, we can call God, God, you are, the, are my creator. You are my physician. There are all, those are all true. However, when we talk about father, this is something essential in him. It's something that he does for all eternity. All the rest that I mentioned, creator, lawgiver, physician, he cures the sick as well. Uh, they are not eternal. There was a time when God created, but he is not a forever creator. On the other hand, he continuously, he eternally, he infinitely begets the son. So fatherhood is forever in him. And likewise, it's good to consider, you know, sometimes all of us catechists, all of us who are trying to share um, these wonderful lessons of divine filiation, we have difficulty in talking about fatherhood to those who have perhaps had a bad uh, relationship with their fathers. While it is true that there are many things that perhaps are not easy to understand, we still have to insist on this because um, perhaps God reveals himself as a father so that we don't settle for anything less. So that we always realize that despite the failures of our own fathers, despite the failures and defects of our biological fathers, we have a father God who is there for us. We will learn how to excuse them because father, the fa God the father loves us. So he's a father forever like no other. Each of us, now, um, you could imagine our Lord in the Sermon on the Mount is revealing this to us. You call him Father. So he's like sharing, Jesus Christ is sharing to us his divine filiation. He is the natural son of God and we are the adopted children of God because Christ has wanted us to be part of him. I mentioned in St. Matthew, this is located in the earlier chapters, in the Sermon on the Mount. On the other hand, in St. Luke, this will also be revealed to his apostles, to his closer collaborate, uh, uh, collaborators, disciples. After a night of praying, they will see our Lord teach us how to pray. And Scott Hahn would say, some would even would think that he mentioned something ad hoc. However, if you study what he actually mentioned, he puts it on our lips. He's talking about something that he, as the answer of God the Father to him after a night of prayer. You have to tell my disciples this prayer because this is how, how they will have to see me. They will have to deal with me. So Jesus Christ shares his divine relation to us in this prayer. So many times we do we pray this in the rosary at the start of the decade, but rarely perhaps do we ponder on its significance. Now um, is the time perhaps to take down notes, settle down with the, that revelation. The first phrase, our father, fatherhood, is already giving us a lot of things. Last line in this first uh, page is, we are gifted, therefore, of filial prayer. We have to be relishing on this wonderful reality because not all realize this, that they are children of God. We have to continuously ask people to talk about it, uh, to, to, uh, to understand this, but it's, it's really a gift. If you haven't felt it yet, 
the next time you pray, I recommend you tell our Lord, Father, help me, teach me, make me feel, make me confident to be your son. Okay? So um, this is the first slide, God as our Father. Okay. Now, there is a pater noster. There's a descriptive, possessive adjective, that uh, pronoun adjective that our Lord uses. And that is our. I mentioned earlier to you that this has definite implications on many things, particularly our fraternity. And now I go to the implications of the word our there. First implication. That there among, in exist among, existing among us a real Christian fraternity. That we are really brothers and sisters because of Christ. St. Paul would write to the Romans chapter 3, verse 29, that he, Jesus Christ, is the firstborn among many brethren. Now, this is real. Now, this is not something we idealize. It's good. It's solidarity. This is also something of our faith. When you talk about our father, it's also extended the concept to not only Christians, but also to the entire human race. What do we mean by this? It means that in the spiritual life, if our father, he is the father of all, the spiritual life, therefore, is not only about myself. Yes, I will be saved only if I do something about my own uh, person. But it's never individualist, egoistic, selfish, and isolated. The spiritual life is not less, it's less of me, it's not about me alone, but it's more of we. We can never forget that there are concepts in the Christianity called solidarity, and we help each other to be saints. We have to help one another regardless, regardless of their condition, their state, and even their religion. I even say, uh, put here in the, in, the, in the poem, Samaritans aplenty. And this is a call really to desire universal brotherhood, openness to everyone, because we have the same Father, our Father God. And it calls us, it invites us definitely to look forward to the needy. These are people who haven't heard about our Lord Jesus Christ. Those who haven't heard about our faith. We have to do apostolate to them. This is called apostoles, apostolado, or apostolate ad fidem towards the faith. And everyone else who has not felt the love of God. You know, um, we are attending doctrine classes, and uh, of course, all of this is knowledge. It's viewed in your screens. But more than this, I think, more than transmission of knowledge, our faith is transmitted by deeds, by example, by love. So the hour there makes us realize that we have to be concerned of those in our homes, of their holiness. I have to be concerned of my own sanctity, yes, but I have to share this good this journey I have with our Lord. Okay? Okay, the hands are like they are Father <laughs> here. Okay, I now proceed. Our Father, who art in heaven? Because there's something uh, important there. Um, it is a call, definitely, to realize that we have our Father in our heavenly home. Now, when God... And Jesus Christ, God the Son, told us that our Father is in heaven. We are only here in this world in the process of journeying. No? Um, our real home is there in heaven. It doesn't uh, mean that God wanted to express distance from us because we are here on earth. We know that heaven could be close to us. It's a majestic position not a position of distance. If we share in his life, if we love him, if we do not have sin, we could possess God in our, in our own earthly uh, dwelling here in this world. So when you say, our father in heaven, who art in heaven, he's making a distinction. This is not, not like your fathers in this world. He's a father who is waiting for us in our heavenly home. We are only at home when we are in heaven, this is this existence of ours and the life here in this world is temporary. There's an emphasis also on that. First, second, third petition are 
in reference to God. Okay? All these, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, have him as a direct object, as the subject uh, as well. No? On the other hand, the last four petitions, give us this day, forgive us our trespasses, lead us not temptation, the rest from evil, are directed, on the other hand, to us. It's all about us. So there's uh, something great in this prayer of our Lord, which is he is teaching us, likewise, to how, how orderly should be our prayer. Uh, many times we go to God because we need something. But when we pray this prayer, we realize, wait a minute, recognize who he is first to us. Skatan would say uh, the first three petitions are God ward, and then the last four are us ward. There are many uh, authors, like, for example, the one cited in the Catechism, St. Thomas Aquinas, who would say there's a perfection in this order. It's good. It's the perfect prayer because we can rightly ask for those things and only those things in our Father. At the same time, there's a natural a sequence that God is telling us. When you pray, you have to recognize him who he is first. There's a very practical application for this because all of us, you give me this, give me that. Cure me, help this friend of mine, um, uh, protect me, etc. It's all about us. Now, Jesus Christ is turning it around. Now, before you ask for your own things, recognize first the love of God, the holiness of his name, that he has a kingdom and he has a will for us, which is the best because he's a father. And the father always wants the best for his children. Uh, in the Our Father, Perhaps you also pray it like me in the official translation, all with old English, it seems, no, for us. When we say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Why don't we say just, your kingdom come, your will be done? Is it because of the translation? Simply put, okay, I, there's a footnote there, and this is interesting. In the other languages, there is a second person that is respectful. And there's a second person that is intimate. Ordinarily, when we study English, we think that the respectful is thy, thee, thou. But in the original sense, you know, the respectful is ye, yao. Now, in, the, in Spanish, it's usted. Translated also to English, ye, yao, you. Now, and then later on, it will be handed to us, it's the only second person. The intimate uh, second person is in the original, is thee, thy, thou. So when we are talking to God like this, in the original sense, we are making ourselves so close to him, so intimate to him. He's not a second person who is distant from us. Um, let's go to the first petition. Hallowed be thy name. Uh, we mentioned earlier, that uh, this is referring to God, but actually, we are also expressing in this, I, I put there, hashtag, I want to be holy. This is what we are telling our Lord God in this prayer. Of course, when you, when you think about it, you know, holy be thy name. That is the word hallowed. No? Um, his name is already holy. No? In, the, in the very shallow level, perhaps, the second commandment, which if you review, it's about the name of God you should keep holy, the name, the holy name. No? Um, of course, it's connected to this, into this um, prayer as well. May your name never be blasphemed, etc. But there's a deeper thing here. Holiness is God's name. He is already holy. But we said earlier that he is our father. So that means that in baptism, we have inherited his name. So when we say, hallowed be thy name, we are actually asking him, make my name also holy. I want to be holy. Make me holy. So the first petition is putting us on a very important frame of mind that our struggle or our first petition to God is this, included in our desires, holiness, sanctity, uh, the will of God, uh, uh, St. Paul's letter to Thessalonians. Oh, in fact, 
are, are here. No? There's some O that is expressed there. There's some fact because God is already holy. But more is claimed. And what is claimed, what is actually being asked, my own holiness. We are called to be holy. God has wanted us to be holy. It's the only plan of God. Hallowed be thy name. May I be holy. Make me holy. Because only you can make me one. It is yet our prayer, our game. Because you and I understand that it's never yet a quality we possess fully. It has to be our prayer. It has to be our game. It has to be our fight, our struggle. So the first petition speaks a lot already. It's not only expressing an O, expressing a fact, the second commandment, but expressing to God, I want to be holy. And you make me holy as well. Holiness, the poem is like that. Or is God's name? Or in fact, but more is claimed. Heirs are we, called to the same, but yet our prayer are game. Thy kingdom come is the next line, which actually is the second, the second petition. Definite is God's kingdom. When the holy, holy scriptures describe God's kingdom, actually it's not referring to creation. Although God is also the king of the universe, it's referring to Jesus Christ. It is a definite thing. It was anticipated in David, in the Davidic kingdom, in Solomon, etc. And then it is fulfilled in our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the king of kings. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. So it has a definite purpose. It starts with Christ. He is the king of glory. Now, when, he, when you talk about kingdom, why did our Lord use that? It's not because, well, there was no democracy. The political situation is not like the one we live right now. The, the, it's Basileia. It's, it's kingdom. No, he's not only saying that, but he, he's trying to mention here that God is also a king. His father is not only a father, but he's a king. That means when, when, when in the context of the first century inhabitant in Palestine, a person is king, he sort of gives the law. He provides it the law, he executes the law, and he adjudicates the law. So the things of God, when it comes to physical law, we cannot break them. The law of gravity, the law of forces, and the law of nature, it's a given. We have to abide by them. But also the moral law. Now, when we study Ten Commandments, because he's a father, he loves giving laws to us because he wants us to be holy. So those things are connected. Now, when God is telling us, Thy kingdom, when I, Jesus Christ is telling us, you pray this, he is telling us also that we want him to reign. He wants his moral law applied also in our hearts, in our minds, and in our actions. Now, um, there are two things that we have to keep in mind when you say, thy kingdom come. In the first level, we are thinking, Maranatha, Lord come in the second coming. That's something we ask uh, also, our Lord. That we be prepared when he comes, that we are ready. Thy kingdom come. When you come in power and glory, I have to be ready. And I want it to happen the soonest. I'm not sure if you really pray this. Uh, I do. No? Um, that the second coming comes the soonest as possible. That we want him really to be here. But also, not only later, we also want his reign to be present in our world. Now and later, Lord, come. When you talk about the kingdom of God, actually, because Jesus Christ has come, he said, the kingdom of God is among you because I am with you. He is the kingdom of God. After his uh, departure, his passion, death, and resurrection, it remains, it's within his disciples, it's in the church, it is unseen. It is not yet visible. However, we know it is present. It's in the hearts of men. It's a different type of kingdom. The second coming is manifest. And we are asking God that it be manifest already in the things of each day until in its fullness in his second coming. There is a wonderful thing here because um, this phrase also, this petition, also is an allusion to the Eucharist. You remember that um, we pray this 
on a particular part of the mass. Now, and um, I'll show you a photo now. This is the mass of Pope Francis with the Filipinos. No, um, because we are celebrating the 500 years. Uh, 500 years of our faith. Cardinal Tag is the left. And I, I watched it earlier. And I want to I flashed it in your screen slate now. Because this is the point when the priest is raising his hands in a position of orans with a consecrated there. And he is praying, Our Father, Pater Noster. In that, in that Mass, what was sung was the Tagalog version. Definitely, it is historic. No? Um, in the Mass, in the Eucharist, there is this wonderful preparation we have. Thy kingdom come, that we pray in the Our Father. And it's there so that we can feel the preparation as well as his kingdom comes in us in the Eucharist, as we prepare to receive him. So the anticipation is really the Eucharist. God wants to come, and he comes in the Eucharist as an anticipation of his second coming. So the, it's quite deep. Now, why do we pray our Father at that point after the um, Eucharistic prayer? It's so that you and I, in praying that the kingdom come, can have the necessary preparation, necessary sentiment of wanting our Lord really to come to us. Uh, so uh, it has Eucharistic undertones, uh, the prayer of the kingdom come. Repeating the poem, definite is God's kingdom. Now and later come, unseen, present, manifest, the start towards the Eucharist. So if you want to really pray it well, the Our Father, you have to pray it with the others in the Mass. Now, um, that's the highest, you would say, form or expression of Our Father. It really is a prayer that is very much Eucharistic. The fourth line in the third petition. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. As like, like the previous two, we're saying something here. We're expressing something because Lord's will will always be done. But we're asking our Lord that we unite our will to him. I want to do your will. Okay. Um, this has been very much, uh, you would say, questioned, no? this, this line. And in fact, when you pray this, it's not easy to say they will be done. No, precisely because you and I, when we go to God, we have our own will and we want it done. Uh, our Lord teaches us that the most important will is not ours, but God the Father's. So um, it's not something, it's a statement of resignation. Uh, they will be done. Whatever you want will be done. Uh, so they will be done. Neither is it a prayer of uncertainty. They will be done, but I don't know your will. No, they're not like that. Rather, it's a prayer that recalls us the covenant. This is why I, I flash here the photo of the Ark of the Covenant. That there's a pact between God and us, and this is the union of wills. It's founded on the fidelity of God and our desire also to second his will. This is the covenant. And what we're asking here, help me abide by the covenant. Your will is the most important of all. It's difficult to say this, but we have to. Many times, we think that we can change God's will. Okay, we can't. We have to accept things. We have to uh, sort of um, receive the things from His will. Sometimes it's difficult for us. But when we pray this, we are not asking that His will be changed. Rather, but our will change towards his will. And when that happens, when we are praying that God changes our will or helps us move our will, we will be able to change so many things, our perspective in life. Earlier, I mentioned to you, the awareness of divine filiation can change so many things. The joy that we have is based on the divine filiation. The, for example, you're so happy, you want to connect it. That's because God has blessed me because I'm a child of God. On the other hand, if there are difficulties, he is my father, his will be done. 
there is something that is difficult for me right now. I pray that it be removed. But if he really gives it to me, he wants me to feel like a son for him, like his own son, carrying the cross as well. And continuously, that sentiment, that prayer helps us obtain that peace. We will be seeing things from the perspective of God. So they, they will be done as a prayer, as an aspiration, as that depth. No? All our prayers are founded because I am a son. He wants the best for me. All of those are alluded to. It's actually the answer for those who are heaven bound. Uh, this prayer uh, in the sacred scriptures um, is, is, is quite demanding, but we see it. No? Our Lord himself said it. No? But it's not the person who says, Lord, Lord, who will enter the kingdom. But he who does the will of my father, he who is um, sort of unites his will to my father, doing the will of God, uniting our will to him is what makes a heaven accessible for us. So it's the answer for the heaven bound. And then there are many other things here, uh, which is represented by the last line, freedom and family found. He, you are my father, uh, the first line, no? And our Lord said, whoever does the will of my father is my brother, his sister, is my mother. Uh, what does this mean? When we do the will of God, we really become his family members. And we obtain the highest freedom. We obtain the highest freedom because we are doing things out of love. Loving the will of God. St. Augustine would say, love and do what you will. The children of God makes it sort of the second nature Second nature of his, to follow the will of God, to accept the will of God, and to do the will of God. My food is to do the will of him who sends me. John chapter 4, a statement of our Lord, if you want to imitate him in that. And we have to really be united to his will. Now, I, I wanted to simply mention uh, uh, that uh, this unity of will no, would help us a lot no, in our prayer. No? Um, it's not only about asking what we want but asking that his will be accepted by us, no matter how difficult it is, make us change our minds. No? And likewise, likewise, be very happy knowing that God, the Father, is really a father for us. Um, there's this wonderful prayer of St. Therese of Lisieux. I wrote it down. God gave me whatever I want, or God gives me whatever I want. She's so confident to say that, the little flower. And that's because I want whatever he gives. Say that prayer also often. Because perhaps when the going gets tough, when it's not easy to see things in its rationality, when it's our own benefit, we have to say this prayer often. They will be done. The last line there, on earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven is also very rich. Um, the analyst would include... That phrase, not only for the will be done, but also for the hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Hallowed be thy name on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. They will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And if you research a bit, the Greek phrase is as it is in heaven, and so it be also on earth. The pattern is really what is in heaven. And um, I think uh, that means that we have to think over and above our own present circumstance each time in prayer, think of heaven all the time. That's what we are called or where we are called to be. That's our home, really. So in ending the three petitions, the first three petitions, the God word, God really placed us on his level. Okay? And everything that is there in heaven, hopefully, will be translated to how it is on earth. A practical uh, application is the Mass, really, where everything is heavenly. That, but that's another lesson. This is a future uh, topic of TFR, uh, liturgy, and I hope um, you are still with us uh, when that time comes.